Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blue Star Rising, the Templar Awakening. Michael Henry Dunn oh, here yes. with my esteemed colleague and uh, co-host, Reverend Maya Nartumid. Hello, Maya. How are you doing? Hello. Hello. Fine. Thank you, dear. Oh, all right. So uh, this is a um, follow-up to a previous uh, program that we shared with you uh, a few weeks ago on the, uh, the restoration and um, specifically the genetic restoration of um, damage done to the human genome and being um, a long, long time ago. And so it, it's um, amazingly um, relevant, uh, believe it or not, even though we're talking about events that took place 36,000 years ago, it feels to me as if it could not be um, more relevant to what's going on. Amaya, do you want to share with us just a little bit about how this subject uh, came into view for you and, and what prompted you to feel that, yes, this, this follow-up program was important and, and necessary? Yes. Well, first of all, it's called the reparation, and uh, this is what Phil calls it. And... Um, when we did the first show, we're talking about the stages of it and how it took place and all of that. And with this one, you know, I talked about the Zeptepi understanding this period of time. It also seems to mix things here and call the beings, the, the those that came out of the Zeptepi, the Zeptepi. So uh, in any case, he speaks about, you know, the, them and, and why they left and why they're back and, and all of that. So it kind of completes in a sense, what we started with. But what I'd like to, to go further with today is understanding more about this current reparation, because he says we're in one now. Now, we discussed it a little bit before, but not much because we had a lot else to cover. Right now, we're just going to focus on that and what that really means for us as best as we can understand it. Um, so uh, I guess that's where I'm going to stop for the moment uh right. I, I i'm confused we haven't seen the video yet have we <laughs> or well, have we <laughs> well no this is um we have not yet shared it with our audience so we have not yet said and now please enjoy yeah. Right? And we, yeah that's why i stopped because i didn't want to just keep going so we'll do, do that shortly uh we're not opening with a video we're doing a little exploration beforehand as we so. to do i do find that um, yes, and reparation, I mistakenly used the other word, that the reparation is particularly interesting right now. Do you feel that the timing of this, Maya, is at all relevant to the potential genetic damage that some people are, are warning us about resulting from? Yes. Well, the, the way that Thoth presents this to me, and I have tried to get the right words for it because you know i can feel these things i can understand them on a level but sometimes placing them into words uh miss you know they they sort of they're okay but they don't really get to it and i really want to get to it so i'm just going to take a moment and see if i can do that um everything is about frequency and vibration everything so we have in our bodies our genetic um the genetic helixes you know the dna rna and all that we see them and we can study them and all the little uh, thing parts of them and everything we look at them but we're really only seeing we're only seeing the mo the densest aspect because to, according to so although he will talk about matter and spirit he qualifies again and again he's just using those terms for us so we won't get confused but to him and to those beings, there is no matter and spirit. Everything is energy and it's different varying degrees. So spirit is up here, so to speak, you know, finer, finer, finer. And then you go down, down, down. And when we get to this, you know, it's, it's still spirit, but it's, 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 it's denser. So we can, we can touch it. We can think we touch it. Of course, it's, there's a lot of space in us all over the place. So because everything is vibration, and that vibration contains specific frequencies. Even though the DNA we see 
has is the most densest aspect. What is going on in the DNA, if we could see it, would be spellbinding. It is so incredible. And the way that it operates and how it connects to what Thoth calls the, uh, what does he call it? I've forgotten now, the uh, genetica, the greater genetica, which is the, the um, you know, from whence from which we get the paragenetics and all of that. It, it's a cosmic genetic field. So in order to divest us of fractured, improper half-light DNA, we don't need to breathe it out of us. All we need to do is shift the frequency. And we give the right command to the DNA. It has to be the right command. And the DNA starts that work. Now, that's what we call moving into the state of the pure jam body. However, before we get that far, there are more subtle frequency changes that can go on in the, in the, in the planet, in the, in the whole field, including our bodies, that allow us to, for the most part, change that story that's written in the DNA right now. Oh, I just got a whole batch of this new information and it's telling me to do this and this and this and this and this and this. Whoa. Well, you shift the frequency and it goes, no, I don't think so. That, that doesn't exist anymore. That's on another frequency and I'm not being given that frequency anymore. I'm being given this one. And then that starts to take place. So it's not magical because we have what, what helps to orchestrate our DNA is our, our, our mental understanding of things. I say mental, we have a consensual reality as Thoth calls it on the planet. Up is up, down is down, and sideways is sideways, usually. And um, so we have this, this mindset and it's a, it's a consensual reality. So it's, it's, it, it is, it's strengthened by the fact that I believe basically the same thing as you believe, Michael. Oh, we may have different beliefs over here and over here and over here, but I believe that up is up and down is down and so do you. <laughs> so, so, you know, the basic principles of what we all believe together hold us into a perpetuity of a particular uh, stream. And so what they're helping us to do, and they have to start on various levels that we have no, no awareness of, of course, conscious awareness, but it's tapping into our higher spiritual being. And that is in training us to see things we think aren't there, to feel things we think we can't feel, to uh, sense things that we uh, up to this point feel don't exist or even those of us who feel a lot does exist we're still not we're still not getting in there so there's something that needs to be adjusted for that now this doesn't mean it's going to be one giant free-for-all the doors open we see everything do everything and we all ascend together it's not quite that simple but again this is a this is a baseline program that starts to unwrap un, you know unravel uh, this this conundrum that we're in thread by thread although it's actually moving rather quickly. And we will get to a stage where we start accepting that consciousness, that reality zone that both calls, ta-da, pyramidus radius matrix. And that's what that's all about, bringing us into there. Because once we're inside it, we will be able to turn loose of this old paradigm we won't be ascended yet, but we'll be able to turn loose of this old paradigm and start learning, relearning. It's just like a person who's had a massive stroke or something and they can't talk and they can't walk and they can't, you know, and yet they, they, they learn. They have to relearn and many of them just go right back to where they were, but they have to relearn it and they have to dedicate themselves to that. Well, we're in the, we're in the stroke pattern. We're all got, got the same stroke, you know, it, it happened to us way back there and we're all just sort of walking around in it together so now we're going to have to relearn how to truly be ourselves truly be the spiritual beings we are now certainly meditation and yoga and all of these wonderful practices are extremely valuable but they're 
selective. In other words, they take time, they take a willingness of the individual to go through that, that dedicated program. And um, while this is good, and the more people that do it, the better, this, this kind of thing that he's talking about is instinctual. It is, it is addressing the core being on a biological level. So you're starting to feel these frequencies and move through them, even if you're like that tax accountant over there in New York that's just running back and forth, eating his meals, trying to pat his little kids on the head, run out the door. He doesn't have time to practice yoga, if he, even if he believed in it, you know. But that person, if he's open spiritually in the sense that he's a good person, he's taking care of his kids, he loves them, you know, he's doing his best in life, in the little lifespan picture that he understands, that person will be able to reap the benefit as well as some of us who are doing all this fancy stuff, you know, because it, it, it comes down to where the heart is and where the intentions are in the soul. Now, maybe they might have to go through a little bit different process than somebody who's been meditating or somebody who's been channeling or, you know, whatever, uh, but they're still going to be given that opportunity to do that because this is a frequency-based system that does not require a spiritual practice. Now, be clear, I'm not saying that you should throw spiritual practices out the door by any means. I'm just saying that this broadens the spectrum to include more of humanity because we are not in an ideal world where we can bring everybody in, you know, and they can all become spiritual beings and they're doing their practices in meditation and yoga. You know, it just doesn't work that way. So the more people that we can help in that way, it frees up the energy. And as it does that, new ways are designed to bring people into a more cohesive reality where they can meditate and they can do their spiritual practices and they can do more of that. You have to start at the base and move up. You know, you have to bring it up to, to the center field of the heart. Anyway, that's my little spiel. Why don't we watch the video and then we can talk some more. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay. I, I, before we go to the video, I do want to make one quick comment on something you were just bringing out, Maya. Yeah. Regarding. Oh, sorry. <laughs> my 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 beauty my beauty light fell apart. <laughs> oh, you still look beautiful. You stop. <laughs> that piece fell off. I'm sorry. Go oh, ahead. Oh, that's all right. You don't need to worry about that. <laughs> yeah, said the expert lighting technician. Yeah. Um, but you were talking about, you know, potential damage that might result from the, from one of the, and uh, let me see if I'm uh, getting this right, because you said that because we're talking about frequency and we're talking about the mm -hmm. astounding nature of, of DNA at the frequency level, if we could see, right, what it was about and that if we raise our frequency, the potential interference or damage that might result would be deactivated or wouldn't take place or could be even repaired simply because the um, vibrational level at which DNA truly operates would simply go, mm, I don't think so. Is that, is it, was that an accurate? Yes, yes, essentially it is. Of course, we started with when this whole thing started last March, you know, Thoth brought out the fact of the H marker that is in has been genetically engineered into the virus and how to create cre to use the reverse h marker and yet you know we didn't have a synapse we didn't have a connection to to help do that very well you know i tried this and i tried that it, it just didn't seem to work and so now we do have with the quantum cube logic and we're going to talk right. a little bit more about how that fits in later this you know i love the way in which you frame this video from the beginning in terms of um, documented history, documented archaeology. You know, this isn't just uh, fantastical New Age, um, spacey, daisy myth making. This is a, a way of understanding what we we understand from history and blending it with what Maya receives from the Akasha. That Nancy brought forth. She said. I am being guided to share with you that the Shungite field, the link to the quantum field, 
at the level of frequency and vibration is actually such that if we utilize our conscious intention within that field to mandate, to command, as I think is the word that either you might have used or she used, to command the restoration, shall we say, of our genetics to its original divine blueprint before the interference. So does that sound to you like um, she's on the same page as? as oh, right. Yes, definitely, definitely. Um, you know, there's a, and there's a whole uh, program or multiple programs by the, um, those who created or at least guardian and work with and build in the pyramidus radius matrix, um, which I believe there's so many terms that Thoth gives me. So forgive me if I get it a little wrong, but I believe he calls them the noblest nata. And they are the a com combination of ultra, B ultra terrestrials and inner terrestrials, all kindred souls genetically to us, which is an important factor because that genetic connection is like a transfusion between us and them. And um, so they have orchestrated a, a, a very grand, um, not that I know all the details by any means, but picture of how this is, is placed and how it works and how they can, um, because it's not enough to just say, I concentrate on this, therefore it is. Not that that isn't you know, good, but we are in, under a, 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 a incredible strain on this planet it's not just brought about by the recent circumstances uh, the energy levels you know it's like a, it's like you're standing on a porch or something and you're a hundred thousand pound elephant and the wooden porch is going Creep. <laughs> that's kind of like the planet right now <laughs> porch carry that into your dreams tonight right? Right. and so so in order to to, to dismantle that porch and keep the elephant in the air while you're doing it and create a new stable porch. That's you got to levitate the elephant. You can be done, young Luke. Like Dumbo, you know, the little right. elephant. Anyway, so that, that's what they're about. And so they're doing different levels of approach. And that's why the Quantum Cube Logic Project, which, you know, was given to me to orchestrate partly, uh, and you know, I'll talk about a little more about how it's working now and how it's working with this. But um, you know, this is our part of doing this. And as we're all working with this, because now we have, I think it's 14, well, 15 cubes, 14 terminals. Each terminal composes a cube, except I have two composing mine, and I believe uh, Jody now will have three composing hers. Uh, so we're calling them terminals. But we have, you know. 14 terminals and we're going to have more all over the planet and so this kind of interaction that we're doing not by ourselves but the part that we're doing fits in to this box which fits in to this box which fits into this box you know to create this this larger uh, scope of a network that is doing exactly what nancy's saying saying but it's doing it on a grand scale it has to be a grand scale so in order to tune into that consciously tune into the, the quantum cube logical field, its interaction with the inner earth dynamic, that this can help to restore, repair the, at a frequency level, any potential genetic damage. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, but the, the twist is that it has, the human beings have to be on a certain vibration to receive it. Now I know you're thinking, oh God, am I on the right vibration? But we're talking about people who have been doing some really nasty stuff in a lot of lifetimes. And they're among us now. And they're souls of God. It's a shame that they are in the shape they're in. But if they don't get their act together, that's not going to be the case for them. That's why we have two worlds, as Thoth says. The world that moves into the consciousness of the pyramid's radius and the world that starts disintegrating. And so when we're ready to ascend, that part of the planet that's ready to ascend, the other just falls away. Now, this is not some finger of God pointing. This is the individual soul's choice. So I'm not. So we can't say that every human being on this planet is going to receive this. But if you have a modicum of spirituality and you're really trying and you're in there with your spiritual heart, you're gonna not gonna be left behind. We're talking about those who are going, nah, don't want it. 
Uh -uh. Right. And, and I think it's fairly safe to say that all of the viewers of our high vibrational program here <laughs> are among the group of folks to whom this is automatically going to happen on a, on a vibrational level. You yes. know, that we it, does, it doesn't require a belief system. You don't have to believe in what I'm saying here. All these fancy words that folks use and blah, blah, blah. You don't have to believe in any of that. You don't have to have heard this program. You could be, you know, like I said, you know, a dairy farmer out in Kansas or, you know, a crop grower in the East or whatever. And, and you're just a good person. You're a really good person. You have your flaws and whatever. And your work, you work till you're just fingers to the bone. So you don't have time to even pray. But you're a good person. And that's what counts. All right. And you don't have to subscribe to our Ascension Manual at nine ninety nine per month and get it fast. Well, get, no, <laughs> you're home free basically. Just you know, keep on being a good person and and um, yeah, tune in. So, which um, is certainly a comfort. All right, so let's um, share with everybody now um, the Zep Tepi um, video prepared by Maya, which is an overview of a larger Akashic understanding of what some have, what mainstream archeology span has dismissed as a myth of a 36,000 year historical arc of ancient Egypt and what is in fact a very relevant and real historical dynamic that is affecting us today. So with that, we will share with you the video and we will be back in just a few moments to explore it further. I'm going to begin by quoting to you from an article by Ivan Petrasivik. The Zep Tepe is now considered by some researchers as a historical fact. According to the pyramid texts, there was a period that emerged from the primordial chaos and the way gods ruled the earth. This period is called Zep Tepe. Is this just another mythological tale, or can we find facts behind the Zeptepi? According to several researchers, among them Armando May, Zeptepi is a historical period that can be traced back to a specific date, 36,420 BC. The pyramid texts the sum of the wall decorations and writings found in several Egyptian monuments have left us most of the recorded history that speak of creation myths of ancient Egypt. Mysteriously, in all of these texts, a period of absence is described, and this period is called Zeptepi. For scholars, one of the most interesting documents is the Papyrus of Turin, or commonly referred to as the Papyrus of Kings, a document dating from the 19th dynasty of Egypt, which shows, in addition to the list of sovereign unification of Upper and Lower Egypt, the list of divine and semi-divine kings of Egypt's pre-dynastic period. Researchers believe that by calculating the decrypted information obtained from the papyrus of Turin, we obtain the initial period referred to as the Kingdom of Ta, P-T-A-H, creator and first ruler of ancient Egypt, dating back to 39,000 years ago. The same source speaks of a time when the primordial gods reigned over Egypt for 20,000 years. After them, the demigods arrived. They were called the followers of Horus. After them, mortal humans came to the throne of Egypt. These mortals began to rule over Egypt around the 4th millennium BC with the dynasties of pharaohs we know today. So how should we interpret this information? Mainstream researchers tell us that most of that is just a myth, and it did not occur like it was described. Why? Because they believe it is not possible, since it contradicts mainstream beliefs. Egyptology and the official historiography 
tells us that everything to the pre-dynastic era is regarded as a myth without much historical value. There are several researchers that believe there is more to this than meets the eye. Italian researcher Armando May dedicated his life to the study of pre-dynastic Egypt. In 2005, May conducted research on the Giza Plateau, culminating in the formulation of his theory of the historical dating of Zeptepi, presented by, at the International Conference on the Sciences of Antiquity held at the Zayed University in Dubai. Armando May explained that researchers have proposed several theories about the monuments of Giza, obtaining several hypotheses about the function of the monuments and the techniques adopted for their construction. Academic Egyptology has greatly contributed to our understanding of a unique and incomparable civilization that developed incredible technologies and advancements in their social, artistic, and scientific life. But for some reason, we still cannot understand how ancient Egyptians managed such incredible achievements thousands of years ago. May believes that one of the most important theories of the past 20 years in scientific terms is proposed by Robert Bouval, known today as the theory of Orion's correlation, according to which the pyramids of Giza are the projection on land of Orion's belt, which was possible to observe in the Egyptian sky in 10,450 BC. Even though this theory has been rejected from the beginning by academics, it has allowed the development of new research methods that have in part explained some of the mysteries related to the so-called pre-dynastic period. Together with Nico Moreto, Armando May developed an astronomical correlation analysis through the application of a mathematical model for the pyramids of Giza. According to these two researchers, the ancient Egyptian civilization originated in the year 36900 BC, providing historical value to the descriptions of Zeptepi in texts such as the Papyrus of Turin. This ends the quotes from that article, and so now I say, Based on what I have seen within the Akasha of Thoth, his streaming from the greater Akasha, the time of the first reparation began around 16,000 years ago and lasted 6,000 years. But let us look back before this. The Nephilim's agenda on this planet included genetic engineering of the then current human races. We know this last and most um, intrusive part was from what we are calling the Anunnaki. We know the gist of this from the Sumerian texts and other historical sources. Yet according to Thoth, the true purpose in its entirety is much more dimensional than creating slave labor for mining gold. It is a large topic and not central to this article that I'm reading to you from here. I mention it here, though, as it needs to be understood in looking at the Zep Tepi within the Akasha that both the Nephilim and the Star Lords, the Zeptepi from the Zeptepi period, came and went from this earth in the same period of time. It is also true that the Star Lords orchestrated the creation of this earth as helpers to the Elohim, long before the Nephilim arrived. If we go back to 39,000 years ago, we would find this to be before the actual Nephilim embedding on the planet earth. An assortment of Nephilimic beings had cruised through and touched down and created interference with the human race before that time, but they had not yet to entrench themselves for the specific purpose that included serious genetic tampering with the human species. The implementation of this plan began around 25,000 years ago, continuing for 1,100 years. Yet the changes made in the human race spawned a drastically altered timeline, which was not adjusted until the first reparation around 16,000 years ago. Even today, however, we are still not what we were 
as a species before the genetic tampering. Now, I'm going to pause in my reading for a moment. Uh, this first reparation was addressed in a previous video, but very briefly, it is the time when the ultra beings, the star lords, came back to Earth and helped to repair the genetic and the Earth damage that had been done. Obviously, they cannot repair it all. We still carry some of that with us, both in our genes and in our planet, but they greatly made a difference. If they had not come back, we would not be here now. So to continue. So let us see how the Zeptepi myth aligns with the presence of the Sun Lords in what is now Egypt. First, we must bear in mind that the Sun Lords were not abiding solely in Egypt, but throughout the Earth. The Middle East and African continent was a primary area for them, however, as it was for the Nephilim, or in this instance, what we are calling the Anunnaki. The location of Egypt was chosen for the temple complex of the Risen One for various reasons. Major was astronomical placement on the planet. And of course, the temple of the, the complex of the Risen One is the Pyramid of Giza and its complex of pyramids. So it was in Egypt that the Star Lords set up a dynasty, not to rule over people, but to instruct and protect, to create a human star race that would continue a knowledgeable lineage of presence on the earth. The Nephilim Anunnaki embedding made this plan difficult to continue. There were the Nephilim Wars, which the Star Lords took no part of. These wars were between two, by then, divided factions of the Nephilim Anunnaki. One wishing to continue the status quo on Earth, and the other wishing to end it and free Earth's humanity. While the latter bore the same wish as the Star Lords, they were willing to use force to achieve this freedom, which included recruiting sections of human populace to the cause. The Star Lords were of a higher spiritual awareness and realized that force was not the answer for a long term solution. So when the wars began, the Star Lords departed, leaving in their stead the followers of Horus to continue as best they could in guiding the higher true purpose of the planet Earth. The followers of Horus were offspring of those humans who still carried undiluted original genetic uh, earth genetics, who had willingly born children from the star lord Solarians. Solarian is a thothic term for all the star races directly related to original human genetics. So the followers of Horus are these offspring. Throughout the period of the Nephilim occupation and resultant wars, First the Star Lords and then the followers of Horus managed to keep a region of the Earth safe from Nephilim intrusion. This was not done through any oppositional action, but through vibrational attunement. And now we take a look at Mars and its role in this. The planet Mars was an outpost for the Solarians. It was given the proper environment artificially to sustain life. There were Star Lords. There the Star Lords first created their complexes to oversee the Greater Earth Project. When the Nephilimic Wars began, so most of the Star Lords retreated back to Mars. Some entered into the inner domain of Earth. They would return for the first reparation several thousand years later. On the planet Mars, were established what Thoth is calling the abode of the Zeptepi. It was here that the Star Lords lived and maintained a thresholding to the greater realms. This abode is now within the planet Mars, no longer on its surface. Yet the outer pyramids and complexes remain in various locations on the planet. Some of these still contain an operational active interior. One of these is the pyramid containing the holographic interface with the Metatron Dweller Crystal Skull. The Zeptepi have not entirely left our vibrational realm. 
Now here I want to say, you know, the they're calling the Egyptologists are calling Zeptepi a period of time, but Thoth starts calling them the actual beings. So that can be a little bit confusing. So I'm just going to point that out here. So I'm going to say here rather the Zeptepi Star Lords, the Star Lords of the Zeptepi, have not entirely left our vibrational realm. For the Martian planet, as we see it, is where they continue to have a presence, as well as its moons and our moon. As always, the Nephilim shows up in these planets' moons as well. In a later period, they would attempt to utterly destroy the abode of the Zeptepi on Mars, but they were not entirely successful. Unfortunately, the Nephilim, the myriad assortment of them, also maintain a presence on Earth. It is important to understand that there is Mars as we see it in our vibrational field, and the planet Mars in its true vibrational field, and that is simplifying it as there are many vibrational fields for each rotating body we call planets and stars. That concludes the article which I wrote several years ago. So this brings us up to now, 2021, and how it relates to where we are on this planet and what is going on now. I think some of it is self-evident. We are still involved in a kind of war on an internal perspective, a, a vibrational perspective, not so much with the Anunnaki, those particular, that particular crowd, according to Thoth, left for now, but the Nephilim in general, there are a lot of different factors, factions of them, and also the Archonic Cloud, which is that viral cosmic cloud of um, miasm that we have attracted to this planet that creates all of this, uh, um, all of the inroads to these infractions. Without the Archonic Cloud presence in our space and literally in our our being, uh, we would not have been able to have been penetrated by the Anunnaki or any of those factors. So here we are and we're sitting in this cloud now, but there is a light, as Thoth likes to say, beyond the tunnel, and that is that we are now receiving the last, the final reparation from the Star Lords. They have returned for that. We say returned. Well, where are they? They are orchestrating from Mars, from the inner Earth, from their stellar abode ships, the giant ones. Uh, they're, they're here, and they're helping us to repair the last stage so that we can shake off this miasm and move into uh, the pyramidus radius matrix, that consciousness spectrum that allows us then to move from a world system one to a world system two, in which we take the planetary genius of this planet Earth into that new system and it becomes the new Earth star. In a sense, we are still the companions, or as Thoth also calls them, the followers of Horus. Because in our genetics, we still have that star component. And not the one that was embedded from the Anunnaki, which is also present in our genetics. But the stronger field, the more definitive, powerful, spiritual field of that which the star lords left us in the embodiment of the companions or followers of Horus. This is a powerful, potent energy. And we have the ability to expand it and to use it in a very um, integrous manner. So when we look upon the human race in general, there's a lot of disintegrity going on. So it is up to us to separate that true vibration out from the morass of the lower field. 
and all the chaos that is going on beneath the waves. We're going to become the ultimate Mayan surfers and surf beyond, above that uh, conflagration of, of fear, anger, and ignorance. So how do we do that? Well, that is a larger picture. But essentially, we must become the vibration that is the cutting knife that cuts through the, the murkiness and finds the true current, the true light frequency. And we don't have to be perfect to do this, but we do have to be discerning and find in ourselves the vibration we wish to perpetuate, the reality we wish to create. I have quoted this on my videos before, but it bears repeating again and again, I believe. And this is something Thoth gave me that I believe is at the core of what we are about now in this period of time in our lives and in the space continuum that we exist within. We live in a multidimensional existence and must each choose where to place our focus and intent. It is no longer about embracing a belief system, but becoming a register of cosmic force that focuses on a streaming of purposeful design. All right, welcome back. So the implications of this are large, obviously, and I particularly appreciated about this, the way that you framed it from the opening, giving everybody an understanding of the agreed upon, uh, you know, the, the place where the Zeptepi period falls in conventional archeological understanding. And then, the reality tracing, you know, a, a 39,000 year arc in terms of really the biggest picture I think it's possible to imagine of, you know, the history of, of the human race on the planet in, in terms of its divine origin and blueprint and what we might call the divine agenda of what would have been the best unfolding before there were the genetic interferences here in the world of half light in the, you know, non, or the oratronic as opposed to the metatronic reality. And so it's um, the possibility that some of the scholars that you brought forward, the archaeologists who are brave enough to propose an alternative hypothesis regarding the actual age of the origins of Egyptian culture going back tens of thousands of years, as opposed to beginning about 6,000 years ago, there is, um, you know, the implications of that, we, we, we see this a lot when what you might call a paradigm shift takes place in a given field of study. It, it usually comes from outside the mainstream. You know, you don't have the president of the Academy of Officially Accepted Egyptologists saying, oh, by the way, my colleagues, guess what? We've been completely wrong for 200 years and it all began 30,000 years. You know, that, that doesn't happen, as I can tell you from yeah. my work with the Shakespeare authorship controversy. And, you know, this in, in this particular moment, because you are bringing in through the Thoth extreme, the larger Akashic picture of what, you know, the, the real deal <laughs> about why we should care. If you're not an archeology span enthusiast or an Egyptologist. And so maybe you could just share with us or explore a little bit further how the, um, you know, we, we, we've got sort of an, an arc 
of unfolding that's taken place in the series of programs that we've shared since the beginning of the channel. And it hasn't always been, you know, linear or sequential. You, you know, I get a call from Maya and she goes, Michael, this just came in. We got it this, this week. Uh, this is hot, you know, off the Akashic presses. And I'm going to be giving you a video and this is, this needs to go out now. And sometimes you've even said to me, uh, I said, well, hey, Maya, can we do this next week? I'm kind of busy. And on one or two occasions, you've said, I'm getting that we need to do this today or like no later than tomorrow. You're making me out a slave driver, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. No, I'm getting, you know, when you get a really urgent tap on the shoulder from the... It's rare, but it does happen. Yeah. Hey, I got to tell you, uh, I'm getting that this needs to go out now. And why does it need to go out now? Well, I'm perfectly willing to go with the idea that you know, because we've got this kind of tribe light, as we might call it, streaming here where, okay, we've got, you know, coming up on a thousand subscribers and it's a very particular kind of audience. And I would say a very awakened, aware, spiritually sophisticated and open audience that they are um, that the ripples that go out from this sharing to those hundreds of people it goes out on a much larger um, rippling across the time space continuum across the field of consciousness on the planet just because it gets out there. Could you talk about that a little bit just in terms of okay, this message about the reparation and it's taking place now has gone out, is going out, as you're watching this, folks, is going out across you know, the, the quantum field of consciousness on the planet. Is it appropriate to, to comment on that at all in, in terms of people understanding as they're watching this, okay, this is pretty cool, this is pretty fascinating, this is pretty interesting. Okay, now we know there's reparations going on and if I'm a good person, I feel like I'm a pretty good person, I can benefit from everything that's coming. Okay, which is all great. And is there a larger ripple effect that, that you feel in, in terms of, yeah, we're just doing our part. You and I aren't going to change the world single-handed. There's all these other levels in the transdimensional field going on from the ultra beings to the inner earth folks and all that. Can you comment on, on, on the ripple effect through the tribe light? Yeah. Well, first of all, there's two levels to this. One is a, is a level that reflects, affects anybody that is doing spiritual work and putting it out there. That energy flows and it, and it flows where the heart goes. It flows where people accept it. And as that happens, whether it's through speaking, whether it's through singing, whether it's through dancing, whatever that, oh, you know, they hit, they feel it and then who, and then they give it back. You know, it's a flow, it's a, it's a dynamic. So that basically is what it is. However, in this particular instance, and I'm not saying this is unique, but this is what Thoth told me about this, is that um, he wanted me to sit here <laughs> in the living room because there's a stream, there's a path. And if you go forward where you can't see here, you know, you're, this the Christic altar is here and all that. And then you go to the round table with the crystal skulls. And behind that is the, uh, the terminal for the quantum cube logica. Um, this stream had been setting up, as I've told the story many times, so I won't tell it now, but just basically, you know, how it started with the inner earth beings coming into my house, and I was seeing them, my cat was scared to death, and all of this stuff. And I didn't know, they kept saying, well, we're just setting up this grid, with my permission, of course, and uh, energetic, and I said, what's it for, what's it for, you know, and, and they really didn't seem to tell me, uh, but now I know, it's for the whole streaming that's going on here and for the mainly for the quantum cube logic of this right back there. So now we have a perfect stream here. Now I know this is a recorded show, but it's being captured in the field on this recording. So when you hear it on the station, I don't care whether it's right after it's been released or five months from now, it sets up that streaming pattern again, you know, through your field, through your connection. Uh, so basically that's, the, the science of it. Okay, so that streaming, as it goes out, you know, across the planet, has 
you know, has an effect, has a, um, is its own dynamic in terms of, well, and as you say, it's connection to the quantum cube logica and the, the various stations of that now, of that growing network, that there is an intrinsic value. Uh, you know, we could have 100,000 subscribers, we could have a million, who knows, someday maybe we will. And yet, there's something about the simple sharing of this, given the streaming and the, the grids that have been put in place, that is much more powerful than would appear just in our, you know, just under a thousand subscribers. So, all you folks who are watching, I just want to thank you for your participation in this streaming and the magnification of the uplifting effect of, of this message. And again, it doesn't require a belief system. You know, you don't have to believe me or Maya or the Thoth Extreme or, you know, or follow some particular method of, of meditation. Um, I'm, no, as you say, hey, that's really valuable if you do, because it makes each day um, more peaceful, more joyful. That's my experience in, in my meditation practice. So um, by all means, let's not toss that baby out with the bathwater of, of the instinctive level of blessing we'll experience um, as this reparation proceeds. Um, is there, do you receive it all, Maya, as to whether there is a further stage of the reparation that's coming? Oh, or is yeah. this basically the, like the final pre-LP40 stage? What, what do you see? Well, this is, he said, this is the final reparation before ascension, but bear in mind how long the last ones lasted, especially the first one, you know, thousands of years. So, so just to say this is the final one doesn't mean, well, in a week from Sunday, it's going to be through, you know, I mean, this is going to last a while. And, um, but there are stages within, you know, there are stages within. And um, I was watching a video that I made, oh gosh, eight years ago, uh, and just happened to flip it on and it was and it was talking about and this is before see i was, wasn't told given the term pyramidus radius matrix until 2014 i think or 15. um so it was a latecomer usually all this stuff i'm talking about you know started way back um but i could see after he gave me the term i could see i could see it in things i'd written before but i didn't know what it was you know um so one of the things was this video I was watching and in it, it was talking about this, this realm, this where the souls are being gathered now, you know, everyday people in life are being able to come in to, and, and to be sort of tutored by master beings in a very specific arena. Again, not through some kind of a religious belief. We're talking about the higher spiritual realms and the master beings who operate within them who are far beyond any religious context. And I thought, and, and when I heard that, I, I said, Thoth, is that inside the pyramid's radius? Because see, I hadn't gotten that term at the time I did that. He said, yes, it is. Right? Various compartments within that, that. And that already souls are, incarnated souls are beginning to be able to receive benefit from inner tutoring, I'm going to call it that, uh, from, from master beings that, you know, it, it's one thing if you have a study, if you have, a, you know, you're a Yogananda follower, you, you, you know, you Babaji or whatever, and you know, you, you do the things and you, maybe you channel and you receive, you know, lessons and things. That's beautiful. But see, like it, not everybody has the benefit of that. Not everybody has the leisure time for that, or, or they haven't, you know, they haven't been exposed to it, you know. So, what this is about, again, this, this type of energy of drawing people into the pyramidus radius is about contacting them in the dream time state and what Thoth calls the tribe light. That's where that word comes from. And um, being able to usher certain willing souls, not drag them in or anything, but willing souls to come into that field and what level they're able to accept to start gently feeding them on that level. Now, obviously, since the beginning of time, there's been the, uh, the uh, higher beings helping us and guiding us, you know, in spiritual connections. There's always been that. It's not like that just started. But this is a qualifying 
dynamic. It's very specific and it's very powerful. And it's, it's that helping hand. It's not saying, come on up in the mountain. It's like, here, take my hand. Let's, let's, let's take this step. Let's take this step. Let's take this step. Let's take this step. So it's a little more defined. And yet the dairy farmer can do it. The corn uh, uh, harvester can do it. You know, the, the, the laundromat guardian can do it. You know, it, it, they don't have to have the time, the leisure, or the, the, the exposure to that consciousness. So it's, it's, again, it's very, it's not a fast track, you know? You can't just bring a soul like that in that has not had that exposure, in this life at least, and just expect them to just explode in spiritual ecstasy and knowledge. They have to go through a pattern. Of, uh, but at least now, they're being offered this, whereas before, they, it was not, they were not able to, at least except for way, way back in time. So that shows you that we've made progress in our etheric envelope. We've been able to uh, shake off some archonic influence in order to do this. So even though things look so bad, it's just that all that goo is coming up in our face now and it's having to be cleared. Yeah, it reminds me of um, something that, for example, in the teachings of, of Paramahansa Yogananda, where in discussing reincarnation, and the journey from, you know, of first becoming a soul until we have the chance to reunite with the divine. He compares it, as I may have shared before, to a journey from New York City to Los Angeles. And by the time you are engaged in a, you know, high meditation technique, such as, for example, Kriya Yoga, but that means in the journey from New York City to L.A., LA being reuniting with the divine, you have reached the LA suburb of Glendale when you are um, practicing a meditation technique. Uh, he also observes that it is possible to spend a very long time in Glendale, right? <laughs> so, because, and part of the reason that we, most of us do not remember our past lives um, is that it would just kind of be depressing <laughs> to the soul to realize how little progress, how slow our progress uh, has been so that we don't get discouraged, you know? And, and when you describe it, because it's, it's where we are now that matters. It's not about, oh, I'll get there in a few millennium. No, you know, God is not only with us now, but our very, our very vibration, as you say, spirit and matter, it's a false dichotomy. Spirit, is the highest level of vibration, and then it expressed itself at denser and denser levels of vibration, such that it's this shirt, you know. Um, and yet, there is it's a, a difference of vibration, not of kind. And so, that, that quotation from um, uh, Aldous Huxley, which is a favorite of mine, which is that the present moment is the only aperture through which we can pass from time into eternity. So um, those of us who can't help thinking of ourselves as kind of like spiritual duffers, you know, we're struggling or getting along and like, oh, okay, well, I love listening to Maya and Michael talk about, you know, these great cosmic arcs of time and the inevitability of listening to everything. But I, you know, I'm, and this is how I feel. I feel like one of these people myself. Um, but like, we must not allow ourselves to be discouraged because the divine is as close as we allow her to be, him to be, the divine mother, the heavenly father, as close as this moment, as close as turning to the divine as a child to its mother in this moment. And so these dynamics that are taking place that we're describing feel to me just very encouraging in terms of the, as I say, that sloughing off of the interference of the mud, of the goo that's, that um, with the aid of these higher beings, as well as us folks, boots on the ground here, we're doing our part. Yes, we are. Indeed we are. And so back to the, the uh, quantum cube logica for a moment, you know, incorporating the, the technical um, 9010 logic, uh, 9010 technology from Germany with these cubes, these quantum cubes and the, and the capsules and all of that. Um, 
we've reached a stage now, as I said, we have 14 terminals, I think it is now, with more to come and uh, that I know of, and I'm sure beyond that. And it's, a, it's become a really, it's becoming a real working network now. We had to go through a lot of stages. We had to go through uh, setting up longitudes, finding longitudes and latitudes. I got a lot of help on that from some of our team members to uh, connect to certain nodes and whatever. We had, to, we had to run broadcast to have those connections established in the field that we're setting up, the intentional field. So this took several weeks. And we may have more to go at certain points, uh, but now we started. We started the real work that gets into um, the uh, well, working with the the repairs, the repairing of the energy system of the surface Earth, and um, which includes very strongly the portals and stargates and how they operate. Um, and what we do essentially, what Thoth is telling me is establish a continuum thread. So we're just doing basically one little thing here, and that's establishing a continuum thread, a continuum thread, like with the Lady of Light through the, the, the embodied entity within the Statue of Liberty. Then we went into the Pyramid of Giza and we worked with the Temple of the Morning Star that is the etheric double of that. I say worked with broadcast in there, established a continuum thread through the actual stargate in there. And now, these nights right now, we're working with Mount Kailash and uh, the, the stargate in there and the various portals that connect to it, um, establishing a continuum thread. But also, you see, it's important that we and I say we, I kind of have to leave me out of this because I'm the one that's been doing this work all the time. But the per people that are, have come into this are exposed to the information, just like you are being right now in this program, that directly connects to the work we're doing with that, with that particular task, whether it's the pyramid or the, you know, and so brings the information in. Um, it's not tons and volumes of it. It can be read or watched in a day, you know, an hour, you know, and we re they receive it, they breathe it in, they get connected to it, and then they become the, the channel or they become the one that sends that frequency through the quantum cube into the, the area, you know. So in this continuum thread, what happens is when we create a continuum thread, um, then the other beings in the noblest, not, not or whatever you call it, noblest, I said it one time, I'm not going to say it again. Anyway, they um, come in and they can follow that thread into that dynamic. Now you'd say, well, why can't they in the first place? Well, they can, but not through our reality zone. It takes us, our human system and our human realities, the, an electromagnetic field that we are radiating for them to go through and go into where they need to go to make the correction and make the see. So that's what we're that's what we're doing. We're not doing all the fancy work. We're just creating those continuum threads. But in the meanwhile, we're also educating ourselves to be able to function in those dynamics. I'm going to be making a second video. You know, I made one video. Uh, intro on all of this and I'm going to be making a second one soon because I'd like for other you know people to see what we're doing and you know see if they feel that they want to be involved but even if they don't at least carry it in their field and understand what's going on there yeah and what what comes up for me as I'm listening to you Maya is you know our channel here is called Blue Star Rising the Templar Awakening and you know, I've gotten a lot of questions over the years in my involvement with the Templar movement and earlier with a um, attempt to linearly restore the original order. What does it mean to be a Templar? And, you know, a lot of folks with Templar lineage uh, in their ancestry, you know, which they're justifiably proud of, wanted to bring that forward you know, that's beautiful in its own way, but what is the essential work going back long before the medieval order, going back, you know, through 
the Sufis who taught the Templars, the Essenes who taught the Sufis, you know, the, the Jedi guardian priesthood of Egypt. What comes through for me as I listen to you is that this work is essential Templar work in terms of the inner temple, in terms of doing sacred science work in service to the upliftment of humanity. The work that is being done with the quantum cube logica by all of those who are listening to this particular stream, this program, these two folks sitting here sharing this with you, you know, that I, I will own that. I believe this to be an authentic Templar stream that, that our spiritual family, you know, is part of that story in our paragenetic history. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to acknowledge all of that work that's being done by these souls as being truly in the Templar stream. You know, here in, in Colorado, we, you know, call ourselves the Yohanin Templars, which, as you may have heard, not only connects to uh, the beloved disciple, you know, St. John, as being the mystical branch of Christianity in its beginnings, as opposed to what's called the Petrine or, you know, the of St. Peter and of Rome and of the centralized authoritarian church. But it also, of course, connects to John Martinus and um, as being the first Templar, as Maya has received it. And whether or not you believe that, again, it doesn't have to do with the belief system or you have to sign up on some website or study some Templar history and get your Templar decal and all that. You know, the, the Templar cross is a very powerful sacred geometry reality that predates Christianity back to basically the origins of the universe. And yet I, I do want to just honor the fact as I'm listening to you, Maya, that this, you know, seemingly rather humble work that's being done, oh, you know, we're just, you know, providing a, a channel, a through line. It's sacred work, it's noble work, it's work done in the spirit of non nobis domine sed nomine tuo da gloriam, the Templar motto of not unto us, O Lord, but to thy name be the glory. So I just want, wanted to, to clarify that, to bring that forward, because, you know, I had a rather, um, let's just say, traumatic um, decision of, of separation from the Templar movement I had worked with and had to find a new expression of it that felt truer to me. And so that's how we began here in Crestone. And, and you brought forward the suggestion that we be called the Yohanin Templars. And it's just becoming more and more tangible and meaningful to me in light of, of this work. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to, to share that with everyone. Yes, I feel the same way, Michael. And, um, I'm very really humbled by what this quantum cube logic is presenting to me personally in, um, I don't want to say culmination because there's never a culmination. There's always something beyond, but it feels like at least the beginning of a culmination of uh, this 55 years worth of consciously working with this dynamic. Uh, because it all seamlessly brought me to this moment. It's not like I was hopping from one lily pad to another. This has been one long lily pad. <laughs> and it's just been kept going, you know. And it's gotten me right here. And certainly working with the Crystal Skulls and our whole Sholar project was incredibly powerful. It's the next in line to this. But the, the Sholar project had to happen to bring me, us, us, me, to quantum cube logic and see so it's all seamlessly designed then the people who are working now on the team I'm, like, I'm going to say team that makes it sound less religious and more just you know we're just a team of people working together that believe in what we're doing and uh, they're also dedicated you know they have lives they have kids they have things going on in their lives work whatever but i've never seen so many people in my space coming in with me in the energy that we're creating together that are so dedicated 
And this makes a big difference, you know, that we can do something like this together. So I just wanted to say that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel the same. And I feel the same in terms of my own story. You know, you talk about 55 years of, of so many trainings and concepts and streamings coming in. And now suddenly it's like, oh, it all coheres. Yeah. It, you know, integrates into this moment. And, you know, the same feels true for me in terms of, you know, my, my theater career, um, my work for many years with Self-Realization Fellowship in Southern California and, you know, service and meditation, a lot of lessons I had to learn and, you know, just in terms of, oh, you know, character issues and stuff coming up in your face and all that. And then human rights work, Templar work, <laughs> you know, um, media work, storytelling work, and here we are, you know, where these um, things I've learned are, are coming into an integrated mission, focus, service. Absolutely. And, and with the, the uh, documentary on the mystic life of Elvis that you are diligently doing the story treatments on and all of that, you know, this is your skills that are being put to work on what we consider to be a very sacred project. So, yes. Yeah, indeed. And we'll share more on that with you at the appropriate time, just to say that um, it's going well. We're making progress and are very encouraged. So, echoes of the king. With that, I think we kind of reached a good closure point. Do you feel? Is there anything else you want to bring forward? Mm, let's see. In well, I still, I still have my shingle out for my sessions my spiritual Akashic counseling, if you're interested. And uh, there are links to that. I have a new scheduling system that I'm actually paying for so that, you know, people can go into that and they get them and they get it and it sets them all up. And, you know, so I'm doing that now. So it's easier to get in touch with me for a session uh, or in touch with the scheduling session. Right. But um, you know, Maya at newearthstar.org is the quickest way, right? Yeah, but but uh, they they did really need to use the scheduling session because it it schedules them and I can find them. And I know where it is. You can always contact me when you go to my page that you see that has the scheduling link on it. There's you know you can contact me from there if you have a question or it doesn't quite fit. You know the scheduling doesn't quite fit you or whatever. You can still get in touch with me. But that's just the best way to say hey I like a session now sign up for one. I choose this day. It's going to let me know, and it's going to send me a link to the Zoom, and you know, yeah. just all up. And the other thing I wanted to say was, you know, I do these 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 uh, mandala artworks and and all of that. I haven't I haven't been doing a whole lot lately, but um, I'm open to doing those for people, you know, for their spirit, personal spiritual work, or for their websites, um, or for uh, their book covers, you know, things like mm -hmm. that. So just bear that in mind as well. I'll put a link to that as well in the in the below this video. Right, and you've all been able to see uh, a lot of Maya's remarkable artistic gifts in in what we've shared. I do want to mention also, as a little bit of a preview, that we have begun to work conceptually on a um, virtual conference that we will be offering. Some aspects of it may actually be live, depending on where the you know opening up of, of social proximity is, but remarkable um, teachers and, and mystics and a, a core theme um, that is in alignment with, um, with the Sacred Alliance of Global Evolution here in SAGE and uh, Blue Star Rising. And we're looking at some time um, in midsummer, we'll have more information for you on that. It will be really good. <laughs> <laughs> so we hope that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it will yeah. too. Yeah. Yes, right. All right. So um, with that, thanks everybody for tuning in. We will see you next time. And uh, God bless us, everyone. Bye for now. Bye. -bye.